Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me OK. I'm Steph from Simply Rhino, and I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth webinar in our series of six webinars focused on the use of V-Ray 2 for Rhino. In today's webinar, the importance of choosing the correct GI solution will be examined, together with using the V-Ray presets that make setting up a scene like this more straightforward. Maximising the available daylight and controlling horizontal illumination will be demonstrated alongside the control of exposure with the physical camera. Additional scene illumination using rectangular lights and IES lights will also be covered. The webinar should last approximately 30 minutes and our presenter is Phil Cook. Phil is an experienced product design professional and senior trainer here at Simply Rhino. The sixth webinar in this series, in which we, which we will look at um, HDR Light Studio in V-Ray, is on Wednesday the 3rd of December. More details on that will be on our webinar series page on the Simply Rhino website and registration will open very soon. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you can watch it again. It will be posted on our YouTube channel, and the link to that is available on our dedicated webinar page, again on the Simply Rhino website. As we progress through the presentation today, please do type any questions you may have and send to us. You may have an answer directly within the chat, or it may be shared with the group later. There will be an official Q&A session following the software presentation. Lastly, quick thank you to Chaos Group, Scan Computers, and PMY for their assistance in presenting these. That's all from me for now, so I'm now going to hand over to Phil um, for the presentation. So, F Phil, over to you. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, my name's Phil from Simply Rhino, and in today's webinar, we're going to look at setting up an architectural interior scene. Now, for those of you that have watched earlier webinars, uh, you may remember that we gave a quick description of how light is calculated, uh, not only inside a V-Ray, but in uh, a real-life um, situation. So just to recap um, on that, um, we have the concept of direct light, which uh, can either come from the sun or from uh, a studio light source. Uh, and then the light that bounces around um, after the direct light is known as indirect illumination. And V-Ray breaks the indirect illumination down into two separate calculations, those being uh, the primary bounces of illumination that we can see here and the secondary bounces of illumination that we can uh, see now. So that first bounce of indirect illumination is um, pretty much all you need in a well-lit scene. Not all you need, but it, it contributes to the uh, majority of the global illumination in a well-lit scene. Where we have a scene that is uh, less well-lit, such as a typical interior scene, then we are more reliant on those secondary bounces uh, of illumination. Um, so here's a, a well-lit uh, studio scene where we're rendering both uh, primary and secondary bounces, and here's the same scene without the secondary bounces, so that you can see there's, there's a difference, but there's very little difference. And indeed, even if we turn the indirect illumination off completely, we still get a good amount of illumination just with the direct illumination. However, if we were to look at an interior scene, uh, here's an interior scene, which is a very, very rough render, but it just uh, it shows um, primary and uh, secondary bounces being rendered here. Um, if we were to um, to remove the secondary bounces, we'd see that we had very little illumination in the scene at all. And if we were to use the same render setup that we might use for an interior scene, you'll see that we get a lot of noise in the render, and we also don't capture an awful lot of the indirect illumination. So there is a particular setup that we would suggest to use when working with a, uh, an interior scene. So, let's just look at our Rhino model to start off with, and the first thing I'd like to say about the Rhino model here is that when one is uh, rendering uh, or modeling an interior, uh, the idea is that you want to model the interior as correctly as possible. So, in this case, we've got a closed volume, and we only have um, apertures to let light in uh, where the windows or doors or openings in the building are. So don't get into the trap of removing doors and ceilings just to let light in because the result then isn't going to be um, physically correct. So I'm just going to return to my 
uh, named view here. And um, I'm going to start uh, with uh, default settings. Here we have a, a scene where we have uh, some materials uh, applied. And um, if I was to, uh, first of all, just go to my uh, V-Ray options and just go through some uh, basic setup here. So I'm going to um, load the default settings. I'm going to just uncheck override output here so that I can render out at my uh, viewport um, size. And um, just to save a bit of time, I'll just say, show the sort of visual that we would get at uh, default settings. You can see it's pretty dark, quite a lot of noise coming off the materials. And um, you can just see uh, through the windows here the environment which uh, in V-Ray uh, 2.0 or the service release of V-Ray 2.0 is now uh, an HDR um, or an EXR um, image. Okay, so um, one of the best ways of um, lighting an interior scene is to make the most use of the available um, daylight or environmental light. Um, and another thing that uh, vastly uh, speeds up uh, setup is to go into our global switches here and just to override the materials just with a basic uh, grayscale color um, so that we can sort of take materials uh, out of the equation uh, just allows us to be able to concentrate uh, solely um, on lighting. So I'm going to add, um, first of all, a, uh, a V-Ray Sun. I'm actually going to use the, the V-Ray Sun object here rather than uh, the Rhino um, sunlight. Okay, so our uh, Rhino Sun is turned off at the moment. If you remember when we looked at the last uh, webinar, we looked at either using the V-Ray Document Sun, sorry, the Rhino Document Sun, or the um, V-Ray Sun. So here we're going to um, add um, a V-Ray Sun object. This brings up the V-Ray Sun Angle Calculator, and I'm going to pick here uh, Wellington in New Zealand, and I'm going to uh, put this for about half two in middle of uh, August and OK this and cursor changes into a crosshair and we're asked to to position the uh, the sun. OK, so we have the direct light symbol here which is the, the representation of the V-Ray sun. So next thing we need to do is to load this uh, into our environment. So we need to load this into two slots, that's the um, skylight and the background. Okay, so we change the uh, texture here to text sky, and then we choose sun one, which is this sun here. And the sky model we're going to use here is the CIE clear model. Okay, I'm going to do the same here for background. So text sky, pick sun one, and okay. Okay, so now I've loaded in uh, my sun into the um, environment. Okay, so now I'm going to do uh, a couple of other things. First of all, I'm going to go to my indirect illumination tab here, and I'm going to change the uh, calculation type for secondary bounces from brute force, which is the default, to light cache. Okay, so brute force is uh, a physically correct uh, calculation that just requires uh, essentially uh, number crunching to uh, achieve the result. Um, because it's a physically correct calculation and because it's uh, not an approximated calculation, um, the number of bounces of indirect illumination are set at three uh, by default. And 
clearly we need to capture many more bounces of uh, secondary bounces of illumination and three. So we're using here a, a calculation called light cache. Now this is a heavily approximated uh, calculation uh, in V-Ray and it's a proprietary calculation to V-Ray and it's a good uh, calculation to use for secondary bounces um, for interiors. It's not a calculation that's accurate enough to use for primary bounces, but for secondaries, it's the perfect situation uh, calculation for interiors. Um, by default, uh, it captures 100 bounces of direct illumination, and without getting into the setup of this, all we need to do is choose light cache here, and then we can go into uh, an interior preset here. We can set uh, a low quality interior and check this and this actually will configure the uh, subdivisions, the sample size and all the other settings that we need to set uh, inside of light cache. So really to, to uh, get started with um, V-Ray, it's a good idea to use these presets and of course the V-Ray Express materials that are down here as well, simplifies the whole setup in, in, in working in V-Ray. I'm also going to choose a camera preset here as well um, to control the exposure and I'm going to um, set uh, an ex uh, a setting called uh, interior natural light, okay, just to start with. And then I'm going to do a, uh, a test render. Okay, I'm just going to check a couple of things in here first of all. Um, and okay that's all fine and then I'm going to do a test render okay so we'll see here that this scene um, is uh, a little bright so I can go into my camera setting here and I can maybe uh, increase the shutter speed to uh, or decrease the shutter speed I should say to uh, 60th of a second from 30th of a second and then I can uh, render again and we should see a little better um, exposure. So one of the reasons why we uh, might want to use the V-Ray Sun here is that uh, on an interior scene where we want to actually position the Sun um, sort of intuitively, it's a lot easier to, to grab hold of the sun object here, pull this around, render again, and move the position of our uh, shadows that we get and the, the, the sunlight patterns on the floor. Now, we're using here the, the CIE clear model um, for um, sky and the reason that we're doing this is that w this allows us to independently control the brightness of the sun and the illumination that we get um, from the sky um, and this is really quite um, important for controlling uh, interiors and it also takes out an awful lot of um, setup problem by being able to control uh, these values um, separately so first of all, let's look at the, 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 the components that we have here in terms of light. Um, principally, that's going to be the um, global illumination, which we could say is the sky, and the direct illumination, which we could say is the sun. The other component, of course, that we get from using the physical sun and sky is actually the background, which is represented as a, as a, um, as a, a sort of a, a color ramp. Um, so um, to control the um, the sky or the uh, GI um, we can use um, this value here which is called the horizontal illumination uh, and the default setting for this is uh, 25,000 now if I set this to zero just to prove a point here um, you'll see that now uh, we've got no uh, contribution from the sky, but we've still got uh, sunlight contribution. Okay, so um, whilst we are, uh, so we're only seeing direct illumination here from the sun, and whilst we're only seeing this, let's just look at 
a couple of things that we can do with that um, sun uh, illumination. First of all, we can control the, uh, the color uh, of the illumination uh, that comes from the sun. And we do this uh, via the uh, ozone value. So the ozone value is, is set here. And really, we're looking at a range between 0 and 1. So if I set a value to, let's say, 0 0.1 here, and we did a small test render area here, uh, you would see that we would have a, a yellowish illumination and then if we pick another area here and we set a value, uh, a higher value to sort of 0 0.9 perhaps, you would see that the, um, the color of the sun becomes slightly cooler. Okay, difficult to tell this on the screen, but you can see that this is slightly cooler than this. Obviously, the sun uh, is always going to be slightly warm in terms of the, the, the coloration that it gives, fairly obviously. Okay, so let's set this back to, uh, to something along the lines of the, uh, the defaults here. And uh, let's now look at uh, how we uh, control uh, the... Uh, illumination um, from the, um, the sky or the GI. This is done, um, as we mentioned a little earlier on, with the horizontal illumination. So again, default value of this is uh, 25,000. And let's just render out again here. And um, so let's take the sun out of the equation this time by setting this intensity of the sun to zero. And now we'll only see the contribution in this scene from the sky. So again, of course, we can control the uh, brightness of this illumination by uh, altering the horizontal illumination value. And we can control the color uh, of this illumination uh, with the uh, turbidity uh, setting here. So smaller values here uh, give us a clear sky and uh, so a bluer color and larger values give us a more dusty or dirty sky which tends to lead towards um, a yellow sky. So let's just uh, look at uh, setting, for example, the turbidity to uh, 2 here. Uh, do a little test render. OK, so you can see that's gone slightly bluer. And let's do another region render here. Set the turbidity to 5. And we'll see this is yellower. There we go. Okay, so the good thing about using the CIE clear sun model here is that we can control the brightness of the sky and the color of the sky independently from the brightness of the uh, sun and the color of the sun. And this makes it kind of quite fun uh, and easy to set up um, interior scenes. So I'm just going to go back to something that would be um, approaching a, a more default setting here. Set the intensity of the sun back up here and render. Okay, so a couple of other things that I should mention here. First of all, um, if we want to soften uh, the shadows that come from the sun without increasing the uh, the brightness, uh, we can just basically use the size of the sun here to soften the shadows. So increasing the size of the sun uh, will, will soften the shadows. And uh, really, this is kind of uh, scene dependent. So you see here that these shadows are softening off now. OK, if we just increase the size further, you'll see that these shadows get much softer. Now remember here also that we're only rendering at very, very crude um, sort of preview settings here. So our, 
uh, quality is pretty low, but um, you get the idea here. So I'm going to set the size back to 1.2, and uh, let's just maybe um, warm up the sun slightly here in terms of the color, and um, just have a look at what we get here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is to um, uh, just look at trying to pick out a few more um, shadows here. Now, the quickest way of doing this really is to um, maybe look at using ambient occlusion, which we can turn on here in indirect illumination. Now, I would point out that it's not physically correct uh, to have ambient occlusion on uh, in an interior scene. In fact, ambient occlusion really isn't a physically correct result. But what it does is it basically occludes or um, excludes uh, light from areas where there is a, 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 a sort of a corner or a change in a normal direction. Um, and we can control the amount, the number of subdivisions, which as you know will improve the quality, and the radius over which this uh, effect takes place. So I'm going to increase this a little bit, maybe too uh, much, uh, too, too more than I would normally do, just so we can start to see the effect of this here. And we should see that on the render pass here, we get some darkening happening around the bottom of these edges here, which just helps to kind of uh, anchor um, our objects onto the ground. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to turn on the materials. Um, all of the materials here were uh, were preset, and most of them are uh, the V-Ray Express materials or, or slightly modified V-Ray Express materials. And just want to look at a couple of other um, things here. So um, now we've got the the materials on, uh, that the render starts to make a little more sense in terms of the um, the overall. Um, color here, and um, if we look at the kind of brightness of this scene, um, the, the the scene uh, on the interior is uh, is perhaps getting towards the correct exposure, but our um, windows here are are very blown out. Now, uh, there's a number of different ways that we can um, attack uh, this problem. Um, and I'll just wait for this render to uh, to finish here. Um, and uh, we can um, examine those areas, uh, the overbright areas, just by clicking this little button here to to show me the uh, the areas that are uh, overbright. So um, one of the um, simple methods that we can do, uh, or a couple of simple things that we could do here, is maybe slightly turn down the horizontal illumination, or we could use um, what's known as uh, color mapping. Now, there is some color mapping applied by uh, default, and uh, sometimes, uh, without going into uh, an awful lot of detail here, um, you will find that you capture more um, color and uh, more of the, uh, the the tonality from these blown out areas by using a color mapping type such as HSV exponential. Basically, um, the idea of color mapping is that if you look at a normal image and you imagine going from black to white on a scale of uh, zero to one, then uh, with a, a render, it's possible to have brightness values that are uh, above one. And the color mapping basically pulls down those overbright colors and clamps them. And it uses various uh, methods to uh, smooth the clamping so that there isn't uh, a sudden cutoff uh, of uh, um, tonality and color uh, when we get to those uh, overbright values. So I'm just going to do a little test render here. And uh, we should see now that with HSV uh, exponential uh, employed, that we just kind of get a little more uh, tonality uh, coming into these windows. And you'll see the bars on the windows are not quite as uh, blown out as they were before now. So we just basically um, pull in 
uh, a little more uh, tonality. Now, um, you'll notice there's an awful lot of noise going on uh, in this scene, uh, and this is really just a combination of the low quality uh, render and also the fact that uh, the materials, uh, the subdivisions on the materials uh, are not um, uh, set uh, particularly high. So if I was to just uh, load in uh, a visual here, which is pretty much the same render, but just with more subdivisions on the floor and the, and the white plaster material here, you'll see how this cleans up the, uh, the noise uh, in the render. So this was the, the before and that's the after. And the, the render time when you increase those subdivisions obviously goes up, um, maybe about two and a half times in this case, but you can see we start to clean out the noise. Okay, so um, let's just very quickly now look at uh, how we can uh, deal with interiors uh, where we're not uh, making use of uh, daylight. So um, what I'm going to do here is to um, just set up um, a slightly different um, sun model here. So I'm going to remove the, uh, the V-Ray sun and I'm going to uh, go to my uh, Rhino uh, sun panel here, turn this on and this is set for uh, this time of year uh, in London at uh, sort of half six in the evening. So uh, not an awful lot of light uh, going on here. And uh, once this uh, sun is on here, I'm going to uh, load uh, this sun uh, into uh, the, the environment. So, Rhino document sun, and I'm going to change the model here to the prism model. So, text sky, Rhino document sun, and choose the prism sky model here. Okay. So, the difference between the prism model is the prism model actually darkens when the sun goes beyond dust, dusk rather. You'll find that with the CIE model, when the sun goes uh, below the horizon, there is still an orange color uh, in the sky, uh, whereas uh, this uh, is not the case uh, with the Preton model. The Preton model uh, has the sky that darkens as we progress. Um, okay, so um, let's have a look now at um, we'll just go into the camera and maybe just increase the uh, the film speed now just to uh, let a bit more light in and we'll just do a default render here which should be uh, pretty dark there we go you can see this is incredibly dark here all we're getting here is this tiny bit of sort of blue light coming in um, from the sky so um, as a kind of a, a, a basic sort of um, fill light uh, in the interior here, uh, what I can do is to use a, uh, a rectangular light here. Okay, so fairly big rectangular light which basically sits um, behind the camera and this rectangular light will have uh, a very low intensity and I'm also going to make it invisible as well so it doesn't get in the way of the camera. And you should see that this uh, now kind of uh, fills in uh, the illumination doesn't kind of give uh, because it's the, the the intensity is set pretty low. It doesn't give uh, much in the way of uh, uh, direct light or cast any shadows. Just starts to to give some ambient light uh, inside of the room. Okay, so while this is rendering, just going to turn on some other um, lights that we've got here, which are um, I put some little lights inside of these. Uh, alcoves and again these are um, rectangular lights that we've put in here so again let's just render a little test area here and so 
our rectangular lights are here, and the rectangular lights are just sitting here. You can see them here, sitting in the top of the alcove. And it's important that with the rectangular lights, that the or any light source in V-Ray, that they're actually not enclosed by geometry. Otherwise, you won't see the effect of the light. Okay, but here I've actually made the lights um, invisible so that we don't see uh, the source of the light. Otherwise, we'd see a glowing rectangle. So you can see here the uh, the rectangular lights are a nice way to to get this kind of feature light coming in here inside of these alcoves. As we said before, when we've looked at product renderings, the the rectangular lights are very subtle uh, and uh, pretty easy to control uh, inside of V-Ray. Okay, so uh, again, um, we can color these lights, and the thing to, I think as we mentioned in earlier uh, webinars, is that if you have very brightly colored lights, then uh, these are going to create a, a very uh, heavy color cast. So we have to be careful to have a, a very um, sort of subtle coloration here, and then we sh uh, the, the result should be reasonably subtle. Okay, so you can just see just a little bit of coolness now coming into that light. So when you do color the lights, just kind of uh, on the side of caution, okay? If this becomes, you know, too uh, intense, then we'll get a very, very strong effect going on here. Now, uh, one other light type that I'd just like to introduce uh, very quickly uh, is the uh, IES light. This is a light type that allows us to um, use uh, manufacturer's lighting files to, uh, so we can actually render the uh, exact brightness and the light pattern we would get from um, a particular um, file. Now, the metaphor for loading in uh, the um, IES light is um, actually a spotlight metaphor, and it's not exactly um, equivalent to the type of uh, light that we're going to get. But let's just have a look at, at how we uh, load in an IES light. So. Uh, we go to the uh, the V-Ray uh, lights toolbar here and go to IES light and we're actually asked to kind of describe um, uh, a spotlight here um, even though uh, the um, actual uh, cone of the light really isn't that relevant this is just used as a as a metaphor for the um, for the light um, itself um, so I'm just going to go into my um, camera here and just uh, make this scene slightly darker just so we can see the effect of this light. I'm just going to put the light in the middle of just in the middle of this corner here so it's it's completely out of context but you'll get an idea about how we work with these lights. So pick the light here, go to uh, properties and light and then on the file option here, we can navigate to um, whatever collection of IES files that we're using here. So if I pick number two here, these are files which uh, Fernando at uh, Chaos Group uh, gave me. Um, so um, I'm not uh, too familiar which, with which uh, manufacturer they've uh, come from, but certainly most manufacturers will um, supply their uh, settings. Uh, let's just have a little test render of this. We should see just a little bit of light going on here. This one obviously is a some sort of uplighter here that we've got. You can see it's putting a, a pattern on the ceiling here. Okay, let's just render there. Okay, so you can see the pattern on the ceiling. Just a quick. Uh, uh, tip here, if you want to just render around a specific area, then check this button here in the frame buffer. Wherever you hold the mouse is, is where we'll render from. So let's just look at a, a second light here. Uh, let's go back to this 
light setting here and uh, pick this one which Fernando has helpfully named NICE IES so probably a good chance that that's a good one um, and again render the scene okay and now you see this is a different pattern here this has got a sort of a nice down lighter pattern here we're seeing this kind of bit of illumination going on here so the IES lights are uh, almost a complete uh, no-brainer to use um, all we're concerned about is loading in the file all these other settings here don't uh, have to come into play at all so uh, you can see here um, just in summary that uh, by using rectangular lights IES lights knowing a little bit about how to control the Sun and the sky and also uh, knowing a little bit about using uh, the correct um, uh, engine to, to drive secondary bounces here uh, interior scenes uh, in V-Ray very clean very easy to set up um, and very quick so um, that's probably all I've got to uh, uh, to uh, to go through so uh, I'll hand you back to uh, Paul and Steph and and see what uh, questions there are Hi, oh, thanks Bill that's great um, yeah we've had some questions come through um, we have a slight issue with Paul's audio so I'm just going to hand my okay. mic, mic over to Paul and he can go through the questions but thank you Phil that's great here's a hand over to Paul now Okay, hi everybody, um, and Phil, thanks for that. Couple of questions. Um, okay, um, Phil, first thing, question from Rob. Where does anyone access the render history window? Okay, so render history uh, on, the, on the frame buffer here. Uh, history is this H button at the bottom here. Okay, this brings up render history, and what you can do here is you can save uh, images um, into the history here and uh, by using uh, this button here or uh, and, and once you've saved them you can load them back into the frame buffer uh, by uh, picking the image here and loading here okay so it's uh, just a case of saving them into the history here and the idea is these images are floating point color images uh, they are not kind of uh, JPEG uh, images of limited bit depth. So uh, the reason you might uh, choose to save uh, into the history here is so that you can compare uh, one image with another. So, um, for example, if I loaded this image in uh, here um, and saved that as A and then loaded this image in and saved that as B, uh, then you can compare for example these two images the one where uh, I um, increase the subdivisions to remove the noise yeah okay what happens uh, when you, if you close the model okay if you close the model the uh, the frame uh, the, the frame buffer history is saved um, to a file so next time you open up your computer uh, even after you've shut it down, all your uh, images will still be in the V-Ray uh, history. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, on the um, uh, manufacturers, light manufacturers and IES files, mm. um, <clears throat> do you find that uh, you can get hold of them generally from the manufacturers or do you find yourself creating them? Uh, these ones have all come from a, a particular manufacturer. Um, there is also uh, a viewer program that I don't have the name of to hand, uh, but I can, uh, if anybody's interested, we can uh, I can give you that information, which uh, actually allows you to uh, view the pattern uh, of the light as well. So that's quite useful. So if you've got, for example, uh, 30 IES samples from a light manufacturer you can actually use the little viewer just to um, give you a, an indication of the pattern and the intensity of the light so yes they, uh, most manufacturers uh, will uh, release uh, information uh, IES information but what they won't release however e uh, generally is uh, model information uh, about the light itself so in other words they won't release the geometry of the, the the housing that the light is contained within 
but the, the, the light pattern themselves, generally that's, that's widely available. Okay, well there's a few people that are interested in that, Phil, so... Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, and um, there's just one more question, um, although it looks like a few more are coming in, but... Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, ambient occlusion. Yeah. Support in V-Ray for ambient occlusion. Yes, we used ambient occlusion um, to crispen up the, the edges. So, what was the question? Does, does V-Ray support ambient occlusion? Is that the... Yes, I guess someone needs yes, that. It does. It's, um, it's here uh, in um, the uh, indirect illumination. Let me just close a few of these tabs here. And it's just a, a toggle here to, to turn ambient occlusion uh, on or off. We can control the amount, uh, the radius about which the effect occurs, and the subdivisions. Uh, increasing the subdivisions just kind of takes more samples and makes that effect less noisy. Okay. Okay, that's the last question on this session. Um, if there's, there's a few others that have been brought up, but I think we'll best respond to them by email so we'll come back to okay. to anyone else that's uh, posed uh, any other questions separately okay so um, thank you everybody um, uh, just want to remind you that the that the last in the series of these webinars happens on the 3rd of December um, this is this includes the use of HDR Light Studio in this in this particular webinar. So um, we hope you can all join us then. So thanks, Phil and Steph, and uh, goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.